started. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started up here. Uh, so we're going to talk about horizontal DevOps today. Uh, my name is Rob Bayless. I'm the CTO at Last Call Media. Uh, we're a full-service digital agency uh, specializing in higher education and uh, government sites. Uh, we also do a lot of ongoing support, and we have a division of the business that does DevOps consulting. I'm here with Jeff. I am Jeff St. Pierre. I work at Tandem. We are also an agency. Uh, we have uh, websites and some consulting gigs, and we make a thing called Lando um, for local development. Woo! Yeah, Lando. <laughs> All right, so uh, session title of this one is a little bit confusing, so we're going to stop and unpack for a moment just what we mean by uh, horizontal DevOps. And basically, we're working in contrast to uh, traditional DevOps, which is kind of the act of building like a yellow brick road to production. So you have um, you know, your local developers and you're gonna be pushing code, you're gonna be running some kind of testing process, that's gonna end up at production. And as you're building this, you might start to construct a pipeline that looks a little bit like this. Uh, you, know, you might start with one project, you have uh, integration with CircleCI and CircleCI does some work Later on, you might add Gulp. Later on, you might add New Relic to that same project, and then you know some testing or whatever. So that, that pipeline kind of develops over time as a single static thing, uh, not, not static at all, but uh, basically it's a one vertical stack. In contrast to horizontal <laughs> DevOps, we're talking about we have to manage multiple projects, uh, you know, 10 projects, 15 projects, Maybe two or three are active, uh, maybe five are relatively dormant and two are just hanging around or something, but how do you manage that complexity? So that's what we're gonna talk about with horizontal DevOps. Yep. And just to kind of illustrate this, uh, what we're really talking about is like in an agency or large corporate setting where you may be rolling out many projects uh, across a time span, you might start your first project with a tool like Gulp uh, built into it. You might work your way up to, on your second project, getting Circle CI built in. Uh, and then on your third project, you might add New Relic, kind of the same way we were talking about before. But the idea here is that we want to be doing this in a way that's going to be scalable, that's going to allow us to take these tools with us and carry them on to the next project. So we really want to be building that sort of upward momentum of the overall uh, agency or organization knowledge base. DevOps. So one, one of the major themes here is we're trying to avoid the DevOps. So we're, we're super focused on our new project, um, but we still have the other projects going, we don't, but we don't want those to fall over. The client doesn't want those to fall over. Nobody wants to fall, them to fall over. We want to keep them healthy. So here's our definition of the problems that we have when we're, when we're managing multiple projects here. So we obviously have clients and they have uh, needs and budgets and that's, that's the real world. You can't, uh, can't develop everything for a finite amount of money. Everything's possible, but you can't do it um, on a budget. So you have to, there's some choices that have to be made there. Rob, you wanna take developers? Sure, yeah. Uh, developers, uh, how many developers do we actually have in the room? Cool, a lot. Uh, developers, we love new stuff. We love to work with new tools. We want React and we want all sorts of stuff built into the project. We might, might want like, I don't know, deployment to S3 of your Drupal site. I don't know why you would do that. But um, we, we always want like the new thing. So that's another kind of competing priority there. And then as DevOps people, we want uniformity across these projects. So if you're working with 10 projects, it'd be awfully nice if we were deploying to the same place, for example. And so these problems are always present in any kind of DevOps setting, any kind of development setting, but I think they become especially painful sometimes when you're working across maybe 20 projects. <clears throat> 
So uh, we're just going to stop here and talk about how each of our agencies manages it. Um, Jeff is going to talk about Lando, and I'm going to talk about what Last Call Media is doing, just as kind of examples of uh, how you might be trying to build this up upward trajectory in your own organization. Great. So at Tandem, one of the primary tools we use to manage this complexity is uh, Lando. So here's what uh, Lando is. Uh, Lando is for developers who want to quickly specify and painlessly spin up services and tools they need to develop their projects. So in that sense, we consider Lando a, a wrapper that gives us all the things that we need for project A and all the things that we need for project B. And they might be totally the same, they might be slightly different, they might be totally different, but they're packaged and managed by this thing that we use. So when we're getting started with Lando, the first command we issue is uh, Lando init. And then we can, uh, so this is in our Git repo. We choose a recipe. In this case, we've chosen Drupal 8. And then it's going to ask us some, some questions about configuring this application. So in this case, I'm telling it that the, the, where we're going to serve from is web. And, um, and then the result of Lando init is this Lando.yaml file. And that's where all the configuration goes from uh, running this Lando init command. So we're following the same pattern as, you know, git init, npm init, composer init. So we're following these similar patterns that are familiar to developers. And the result of this is this .lando.yaml file. So that Lando init command that we just run results in this single YAML file. It has the name of the application, the recipe that we chose. You don't have to start with a recipe, but recipe is a really convenient way to get going if you want to uh, start with a Drupal 8 or Drupal 7 or Drupal 6 project get you going super fast, and then you can extend it from there, or you can go full-blown custom right away. So we have a config key here, and the only thing there so far is that we're telling that we're going to serve out of a subdirectory called web. After you initialize the application, you're going to do uh, Lando start, and that's going to spin up your uh, the Docker containers. Lando is based on top of uh, Docker Compose. So it's going to spin up all the containers that are necessary to run the application, depending on whatever recipe or whatever's in your .lando.yaml file. Um, <clears throat> so Lando start spins up those containers, and then uh, it spins up a database uh, container, uh, applications container, and then you have, in this case, a working Drupal 8 site that you're uh, ready to start developing on. So the next thing that we recommend that you do is commit that configuration file, that .lando.yaml file, to your repository. This way, you're sharing that configuration amongst all of your developers. So uh, you have a team of three, a team of 10. Uh, once your initial DevOps is done with this Lando init and, Lando, uh, and you commit this file, they pull that down. They have all the configuration necessary uh, to run this application. So when you do a Drupal 8 recipe, for example, that's pulling in Drupal console. Drush, things like that, so you have those toolings that you need to run that application. Uh, so with just a Lando init and answering those questions, you get a very simple file. This is an example of what I would call a sort of whelming file. It's not overwhelming, but it's a little more complex than, than, the, uh, than the first you know, five or six line file that we saw. So this is intended to demonstrate some of the flexibility that you can add in besides just doing the Lando init and starting from a recipe. So here we're still starting from a recipe. We have a couple more things under the config key. So we still have uh, web root is web. Now we have via Nginx. So we can start creating uh, production parity here. So if, if you're serving with Apache, by default, the Drupal 8 recipe is going to serve from Apache. But you can specify Nginx or you can specify Apache here. and uh, you know. Specify whatever you're using in production, so you're starting to get that, build up that parity. PHP key, we're specifying PHP 7.1 here. We can go backwards to 5.3 and upwards to 7.2. So if you have one application on 7.0, one application on 7.1, super easy to swap it out. Uh, Lando rebuild the application, get a new container that has the, the right components for whatever uh, application you're working on. Similarly, you can hot swap uh, databases, uh, or specify what kind of databases you want. In this case, we're specifying MariaDB. Uh, you can uh, pop in Xdebug, so you can have Xdebug across all your developers. Um, Lando's going to spin that up and have the things you need to, to use Xdebug. So here we have a services key, and we're saying on the app server, we want to run a certain command. And what we're doing here is pulling in the platform CLI. 
So in the example that you're hosting on Platform SH, you could pull in that Platform CLI and have access to that right in, right in the application across developers. Um, and then the tooling key is gonna expose that command. So we're saying expose the Platform command on the app server and run this command when people have it. So that's gonna ex uh, expose the Platform CLI to the Lando users on this project. If you just run uh, bare Lando on, a, on an application that's using a .lando.yaml file, it will give you a list of the things that you have available to you, the toolings you have available to you. So some things like in a PHP app, you're gonna have, uh, it's gonna come around here. So I have Composer available to us by, by default on a PHP application. In the case of a Drupal 8 app, we have um, Drupal, uh, Drupal console and Drush available to us, and there's that platform command that we exposed in the, in the tooling route. So most of those that you see up there are defaults for the Drupal 8 recipe. The platform one is an example of one that we piped in via that run command and exposing it via tooling. And you can add in as many other things as you might need uh, with similar configurations. Uh, and there's lots, lots to say about that on the documentation. Cool. Rob, you wanna talk about your? Sure. Yeah, I guess I would just mention that I think the really powerful way about, thing about the way you guys use Lando is that that configuration file exists in the project and it's gonna be more or less the same setup steps for every single project for you guys. So as a developer's coming on, they're gonna start with Lando start. That's gonna remain consistent. Uh, so this is a slightly different solution to a similar problem. Uh, Last Call Media had an issue several years back where we were starting every project fresh and uh, we basically were repeating things but not sharing anything. Uh, so we started kind of our own like place to put this. Uh, it's called the Last Call Media Drupal Scaffold and it's just a boilerplate Drupal 8 build that contains like, you know, like our PHP CS configuration, our circle build, our um, ideal deployment process, that kind of thing. Uh, this is an open source project as well, and you're welcome to check out the URL, which is down on the bottom left. Um, we have pretty explicit setup instructions for local development, which are shared between all of our projects. So any developer that's coming onto our projects is gonna see this to start with on the project page. And these steps are basically the same between all of our projects as well. Uh, so again, quick setup, you know, Docker Compose is what we're using, and uh, we use additionally Composer and Yarn, always built into our projects. So those are sort of the three things that we know are always gonna be there, and we rely on them from project to project. Uh, one thing I would point out is the last step, which is this site import uh, command that you're gonna run. I'm gonna go through that in a little bit more detail in a moment, but for now, just know it's the last step. Uh, we do most of our actual tooling inside the projects with Composer scripts, and we try to keep a few commands absolutely locked in and the same across all of our projects. So even though we're starting from the same point, we may be able to deviate each project in certain ways uh, but some things are gonna stay the same. For example, you have a composer build script, and build is gonna be compiling your static assets. Whatever that means for this site, whether it's gulp or grunt or webpack or whatever, uh, composer build will always invoke that. Uh, we have you know, linting, so composer lint is gonna mean the same thing across all the projects. Uh, testing, this is another area that can differ from project to project. So we'll have like, you know, visual regression testing on one project, we might have bhat, we might have PHP unit. Uh, but the composer test command will do all the, the setup and the, the invoking of all that stuff. And then finally, this site import command down here. And all that does is, uh, everyone, sorry, I should probably ask this first. Does anyone not know what Composer scripts are? Okay, no one. All right, well, just in case, uh, Composer scripts are, are ways that you can specify in your Composer file commands that can be invoked using Composer, whatever the word is. Um, and so this site import command is just something that you can invoke 
via Composer, and it does whatever is written here. And again, this is going to be configurable on a per project basis. So you can see that on this one, we have uh, refresh local Pantheon is what happens when site import is run. So that's going to pull a database down from Pantheon using the terminal, Terminus CLI and import it into our local site. So you can imagine that on Acquia, that shell, shell script might change. But what's cool is that the developer only needs to know that Composer site import works on, in both cases. So again, we're trying to keep that consistency from project to project to project to avoid the spin up time as developers hop between projects. The other thing that we've done a lot of work on in our scaffold is uh, the Circle CI integration. And we've got three common steps that are gonna happen pretty much any time you push code to one of our repositories. Uh, we've got a build step, which is going to do all of our asset compilation, all the vendor uh, third-party dependency pulling in. Uh, and then we've got a deploy, which is going to send it to whatever the destination is. Uh, in this case, this is a Pantheon multi-dev instance, so don't worry that the, the test didn't pass. Uh, not everything is broken. Um, and then we have this test step. And again, that might differ from project to project to project, but as a developer, Coming into this project, I know exactly what to expect when I hit Circle CI. I'm going to see that there's a build, deploy, and test, and I can see instantly what failed. So we share that across all of our projects again, and it's been a really nice way to kind of make sure that we're always keeping that upward trajectory uh, as far as our tooling. Great. So why did we pick X? Meaning, you know, why is uh, last call used Drupal Scaffold and uh, Tandem use Lando. Thought you were going to come here and get the, the golden road. Everything was perfect. All your problems solved. Well, it's complicated and there's lots of decisions to make. So the, the thing we'd like you to take away from this is pick something, think about it, and make some decisions. So it's good to think about these things and come to some conclusions. So that's what we're going to offer you here, some, some guidelines. Yep. Right. And Ed just want to expand on that and say that we're, our message here is that as an organization, you should be working to build that DevOps capacity and the organizational kind of uh, knowledge, knowledge base. So the guidelines that we're going to present here are in service of that. Uh, first things first, we have to recognize that you do need to invest in DevOps as an organization. Uh, if you want to improve your tooling, improve your project, first you need to actually spend some, some time doing it. Uh, the way that we sort of suggest getting started with that is we're all working on individual projects today, and as those projects progress, you're going to hit a moment in every project where something breaks and you don't understand why, but you have to spend the time to fix it. So if that something has broken more than once, or if it's something you anticipate having to, to deal with again, spend the time to actually come up with a good solution for it in the scope of that project. Uh, and as you're doing that, just kind of keep it in the back of your mind that you spent that time, you should be considering after the project, how do we actually take that and make it a universal solution for all our projects? So just as a concrete example of this, uh, during one of our projects, we, have, we kept having an issue with CSS breakage. So we would make a change, and then we would push it. Everything looked great. We would push it to production, and uh, there were pages broken that we didn't know about. So I think we've probably all had that experience before. We spent some time uh, during the scope of that project to implement visual regression testing. And we did it in a way that enabled us to kind of go back later on and pick it out into that uh, Drupal scaffold and really like leverage that going forward in a very simple way. Leverage it against more than one project, more than just the project. All of our projects. Developed. So, yeah. so all the projects benefited from it. Yep. The other thing I would add to this slide is that um, it's really great and probably necessary to have buy-in from your, the upper level of your company, the, the CEOs and CTOs, because uh, otherwise it's unlikely that someone from the ground up is going to carve out this time for this stuff to happen. Uh, but if you're 
If your top level of your company is encouraging that and they recognize that there's value in that time, um, then it's going to be more likely to happen. Yeah. And I think also, uh, as far as like identifying those things and pulling them out into this global namespace, as we're calling it, this is the practice that we'd like to encourage. Um, retrospectives are a really great chance to, oper to, to really like recognize it and pull it out and identify that it is a thing that could be fixed across many projects. So as DevOps people, we want to stay involved in those retrospectives and make sure that uh, we're hearing what, what people are saying. So why, why invest in DevOps? So these are probably pretty well known, but we want to state them for clarity. So when you, if you choose to make this investment uh, of time and money and people power, um, you're going to increase efficiency. You're going to be able to move more quickly per project. You're going to become uh, more productive. So you're not going to have to worry about uh, the annoying breakages. You're going to be able to uh, focus on the things that's making the project move forward and making your skills move forward. Rob, you want to take over on developers? Sure. Yeah. Uh, your developers are going to be able to move a lot faster if they have the confidence that something small is not going to trip them up. So, you know, using the example of like, imagine that on project number one for your agency, you implemented a BHAT test that went through and checked that the home page bootstraps. Really simple check. But uh, having that in the future, just that is the home page loading, seems like a pretty simple way to like, remove that from your developers' brains and just make it so that they don't need to worry about that kind of breakage. That'll be caught automatically. They can focus more on the hard problems. So it's going to let them move a lot faster and develop a lot faster. Uh, and then sort of the next thing, as you develop this tool set, you're going to find yourself able to take on much more complex projects uh, using the same resources. So you have all that sort of like aggregated knowledge, process, technology, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can carry that from project to project and really use it as a stepping stool to jump up to the next level in terms of what your company is able to deliver. And then finally, if you're able to actually develop this DevOps practice into more of like a, a, a habit that is well known, uh, as something your company does well, then it can really become a good revenue stream or a selling point for your company. If you're able to go into project pitches and say, uh, yeah, we, we do all sorts of testing. We're excellent at implementing test pipelines and production pipelines. Uh, that's something that, that sells very well. Right. Uh, so who's on my Dev DevOps team? I think this is an interesting question. Uh, we did this session at uh, Nerd Summit in Western Massachusetts, and there was a person from Datadog there who basically called us out at the end of the presentation and said, that's all well and good, but I think that this doesn't just apply to DevOps people. I think that everyone in the company should be a DevOps person. And that's a really, really good point. Uh, we think that the people that are involved in DevOps, they might not be DevOps people, uh, but they're really anybody that is on the team. They're people that participate in you know, the daily activities, development, quality control, whatever. Uh, and they're aware and mindful of the sticking points that they're hitting on deployments, on you know, regular development. And they're just focus on Im improving like the technical flow of the projects, making sure that those are going smoothly, and also being responsible for either identifying or actually pulling those uh, slight improvements that are made from project to project up to the higher level so that they're surfaced to the organization and available for projects going forward. Yeah, I would say that a large part of that too, of including everyone in the DevOps workflow, is, it, is it's a flow. So. Uh, pay attention to where you know, DevOps hands off to a developer uh, and vice versa, where a developer feels a pain point but they don't necessarily know how to solve it. If you have your DevOps hat on on the background, you can at least make a bullet point for that to bring that up to your DevOps people in, the, in a stand-up or in a retrospective so that if you always have kind of this DevOps hat in the background and you're injecting DevOps into all your processes, 
that's where you're going to get the flow increase of efficiency because you're communicating that to each other, identifying those pain points, and then giving yourself, your, your company, an opportunity to do something about those through communication. Building your global namespace. So this is what we're talking about, about uh, building a tool set that can work across projects. So what are these things? So in, in, in a super simple sense, uh, they are uh, Lando and Drupal Scaffold. Those are definitely things that move across all of our projects to help us have uh, similar and consistent workflows. Uh, but we also want to see what else we can pull in and how we can uh, manage these tools once we start building them up. And they don't have to be tools that you built in-house either. I want to definitely highlight that point that, you know, even if you, part of this global namespace is figuring out how to use some external tool, uh, that's, that's part of this too. Absolutely. Uh, I would include, you know, Composer and Drush in that. Like those are, those are part of the tools you need to build your application, so they're part of your namespace, part of the stuff you're managing. How you manage that matters. So one thing that we think is leveraging semantic versioning. So if you have this in-house tool set that you're controlling some, some way, either through like Docker Compose files or through Lando configuration files, uh, version that thing, some, do use semantic version, even if it's just an in-house tool and you haven't released it as open source, we encourage you to release it as open source if you have something that's useful to people. Uh, but if you, even if you don't and you still use semantic versioning against it, you're going to be conveying information to your users, which may be just your developers, or they may be many developers if it's an open source project. So uh, minor point re release, if you go from 3.0.0 to 3.0.1, uh, you're with no other information, just your developers seeing that, through Semver, they know that this should be a non-breaking change and I should feel comfortable doing it. They probably have a safe way to test that. Uh, and then they know if you go from 3.0 to 3.1, that something might be changing, I should have, at the very least check out the readme before I move forward with this thing. So we think there's value in, in uh, using Semver, even on your in-house tools, uh, treat them as if they're an open source project or release them as open source. Yep. Uh, the second point here, package managers. So we have some really great tools out there available to us for distributing code. Uh, this is something that comes up as you're talking about how to actually implement this. Uh, let's imagine that on project number one, you have a shell script that you're using for deployment and you want to share it with project number two. So the easy, simple way to do that would be copy pasta that thing right in there. Uh, the problem is that then when you go and update the script, there's no central source of truth and there's no way to update the, the projects in the future. Uh, so we encourage you to use things like uh, composer, things like NPM to really distribute that stuff, put it in a repository, whether or not it goes public or not, both uh, composer and NPM have mechanisms for private package sharing and it'll allow you to share that code out. And if you're using semantic versioning for it, it'll allow you to even control what gets pulled in. If you want to pin it to a specific uh, minor release, that's fine. Um, documentation, this one is absolutely critical across the board and it's something that even for something as, as simple as a shell script, the likelihood that the writer of that shell script is going to be the one that finds the bug and fixes it later is pretty low and you really want to make sure that everyone in your organization is enabled as much as they can be to get involved with this process and to contribute back to the DevOps tools that you're sort of aggregating here. So keeping your documentation up to date is really important and we have a whole slide about that later on. And then uh, finally, yeah, just defining and sharing your release workflow for all of these to tools. So like if you have six shell scripts that are all in their own packages, it would be awesome if each one used the same process for getting rolled out. So it would be like, imagine, a change is just a git commit, git tag, and then update the change or update the change log and then git tag it probably. Uh, so just try to keep that consistent across your tool tool set. Thinking in interfaces, yes. So this is a little bit more abstract, and this is something that we touched on during our 
uh, our demonstration of our individual tools, but an interface is something where two systems kind of touch, and in this case, it's our DevOps tooling and our developers, or our DevOps tooling and our PMs or stakeholders, whatever. Um, so this would be, we're encouraging you to think about how developers and stakeholders and PMs interact with your tools. So is it a single command? If it is a single command, it's probably good not to break that command or change that command. Yeah. So by thinking about the places that uh, the stakeholders are touching these processes and how they interact with them, we're establishing a contract with them. So if we're going to change something of that level, then we're going to have to go from 3.0 to 3.1. We're going to have to document it we're, because we're pulling the we're pulling the contract out from under their feet. So it has to be communicated and rolled out in a slow enough fashion. So Rob and I think that if you think this way, that you're going to develop modular tools that can be pluggable and, and come in and out of your processes uh, with the least amount of harm possible. And hopefully the reason you're doing that is for actual benefit and not for harm. So we're going to try to minimize how much we uh, change that interaction. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't change the implementation details. Rob mentioned in, uh, earlier that, you know, uh, composer build might run grunt, it might run gulp. That shouldn't matter too much to the, to the user. Uh, their interaction with it is the same and their result is the same. They get a built asset pipeline. Um, so yes. just to quickly define that, I think our, our interface at Last Call Media is the set of compo composer commands that I showed you, build, run, uh, sorry, build, lint, test, uh, site import, and for you guys, it's essentially Lando start is, is your interface with your developers. Yep, Lando start, and if you run the bare Lando command, all of the tooling commands that are available, are, are that's our interface. Yep. yep. Cool. Yeah, right, and our goal here is to make uh, new developers coming onto the project as seamless and uh, easy as possible because we want to be able to have people hop from project to project. All right. Don't be dogmatic, yeah. So I think in the tech world, it's pretty easy to get locked into certain ideas and certain decisions. And I think that that can be really dangerous. Um, you know, things like, like I think Drupal has long, for a long time had a resistance to Composer to the point where that became a little bit burdensome. And then we, we heard in Drew's talk today uh, about how we're encouraging like more widespread composer use. So really check your dogma at the door as you're coming into this de DevOps thing. Uh, try to look at every solution or every problem as its own problem and don't envision solutions first. So handling outliers. So it's, it's great to say that we're gonna, we're gonna make this you know, beautiful tool set and everything's gonna be perfect all the time. Uh, but that's not reality. In reality, you know that every project is going to have, you know, some outliers. So what we want to do is acknowledge that um, and make sure that our processes are flexible to accommodate those things. So that goes back to the, the, the interface kind of paradigm, how we're thinking about this and, and encouraging modularity so that we can accommodate these things. Um, so we know that these differences are going to, they're going to cost money because it's going to be a thing you have to figure out. So be frank with your clients, you know, be like, hey, like we're, we see this thing and it's, it's different than, than everywhere else. Um, and it's gonna take some time and some money. And the, then the, the client's answer might be that this is an absolute necessity. This is a value add to us. We, we need this as a project requirement. And then you're on the same page, you're gonna, you're gonna spend the time and the money and deliver the value to the client. But the answer might be, oh no, we didn't realize that that was so hard. Maybe we shouldn't spend, you know, 30% of the budget on that one thing. So put that out there, um, identify the outliers in your process and see if they're worth it or not. Make, make some decisions based on that. But then if you do move forward with an outlier, um, you, you might have an opportunity to abstract that back to your global namespace. Once you solve that problem, uh, it might be useful to you to be able to use that on either all client projects or enhance the set of clients that you can work on. One example that Rob and I talked about a lot is like hosting. Like, if you standardize hosting on like 
Pantheon exclusively, that's fantastic, and that makes your development life and your operations life pretty easy. But if you get a client that requires uh, something else, either contractually, if they need platform SH. WordPress.com. WordPress.com. Uh, and, uh, and, and there you have to make a decision. Like, is this worth it? Is this a value add to the client and to us? And if it, if it is, maybe that's an opportunity to abstract that back out to your global namespace and be able to handle more clients of that type. And you had the example of the visual regression as well, where, where you uh, Right. Benefit yeah. One client. Right. And uh, so I kind of talked about this earlier, but we had like you know a client where they had some some very stringent. Uh, I'm not going to call them pixel pushers, but they were very good at QA, and uh, <laughs> so like their their requirements were a little bit different from the rest of our our uh, client set, and it we used it as an opportunity to get that visual regression testing system in, and. Uh, that really benefited all of our clients in the end, uh, and us as an agency as well. Right, documentation. I told you we had a whole slide about this. So we think that you need a lot of documentation, but we think that you can do it in a smart way that's not going to be a huge pain to maintain. So at the top level, your company needs a README. This would outline you know, the things that you have as part of your process. It might have links off to external tools that you use. It might have all of your best practices listed in there. And it's a document that you could reference back to from some of this lower level documentation. Go so, uh, extending that idea, all of your tools need to read me. So in the case of the examples that we're talking about up here, Drupal Scaffold has a read me. And that's kept up to date, and Lando has uh, documentation pages where you can go and read those. Um, and so figure out how you're supposed to interact with the tool. What is the way the tool is supposed to work? And then by extension, every project is going to have a README. And of course your project should have a README. You should tell developers how to spin up the project, how to use the project, and how to get productive on the project. But we think the value in structuring it this way is that now you can have that project README uh, um, focused on the differences between projects because everything that's the same about them is upstream in your company readme and your tools readme. And now you can focus on what, what things are different about this project that you have to know. So we think this makes sense to uh, be able to extend your documentation. And just keeping it up to date is so important. It's such an easy step to skip if you're given the opportunity, but just don't because you could be poisoning a developer downstream that doesn't know about this difference because it's not in the README when something was changed and then they can't be productive and then they're stuck. Poisoning. Uh, all right, yeah, so I want to take a moment to remember back to that slide that we had with all the boxes where we're stacking things up. And I think that we made a very conscious choice when we started thinking about this presentation not to talk about some of the really hard problems in DevOps, like hosting and logging and, you know, there's a whole host of things out there. Uh, we think that agencies and large sort of corporate entities that are building out many sites at once should not be doing these things. We think that you should be delegating these things to good partners. So people like Pantheon, Platform, and Acquia, all of whom are sponsors at this conference, uh, are great fits for this. You shouldn't be worrying about how your code uh, gets from the Git repository to the dev site. Like that's, that's a solved problem. And it's not really worth us spending a lot of time on. What you should be worrying about is making sure that what you're pushing up is of good quality and that it won't break the site. So we think that you should pick people, partners that are aligned with whatever your goals are as uh, an organization, and also ones that are easy for you to work with. So if you really like, uh, let's imagine Pantheon, uh, their multi-dev service is just the way that your organization works, then great, go with them. The thing is, you're not always going to be able to get that. So this goes back to that question of outliers and how you handle them. Uh, when a new client comes on, sometimes they come on with specific hosting recommendations. And unless that recommendation is like WordPress.com, then you should probably not force your, your uh, partners on them. 
On the other hand, we do have often the ability to make recommendations. So if they come in and they say, uh, we would like to host on, I don't know, Bluehost, you could say, you know what, that's, that's awesome. I'm really glad to hear that you've thought this through. Um, just so you know, we work really well with Pantheon and uh, Acquia, both of whom are wonderful hosts and have competitive pricing. And uh, we think that development would actually move forward a lot smoother if we're able to work with uh, one of those two. And so I think that that's our role in this, this conversation about hosting, is to inform the clients about who the, the kind of best partners are uh, the ones that you work well with, and just be honest about like what the limitations are. Continuously reevaluate. This is also key. Uh, this speaks to not being dogmatic, and and many other points that we've made throughout. Um, you just you absolutely have to uh, look at what's going on, and seeing if you should continue in that direction or if change is needed. Rob, you want to take the quote? <laughs> yeah. Right. So I like this quote uh, from Stephen King. Uh, it's about killing your darlings, which sounds a little violent, but um, really what it's about is he's a writer, and he's saying that uh, when you're writing, sometimes you need to kill the things that you love at a particularly dramatic moment in the story to further the story. And as developers, I think we kind of have, or developers and ops people, we need to really take this to heart and consider it because sometimes the tools that we build are not the best solutions for us and we're kind of blind to the fact that, uh, that that's the case. So we should always be a little bit sad but a little bit enthusiastic to kill off any of our own stuff because it means less for us to do. So as you're evaluating your process, just keep this in mind and see if there are ways that you can reduce your overall technical load, even if it means killing off your favorite, I don't know, project that, that you built in. Right, and so DevOps is all about iteration. You know, we're trying to move quickly, we're trying to be agile, and your needs are gonna change uh, you need to be responsive to feedback, and you need to be able to collect that feedback as well. Uh, monitoring is a huge piece of making sure that your overall process is working, and that can be really tricky when you're talking about, I don't know, 20 projects or whatever. But just start with what you have. Um, as far as gathering metrics, maybe like just take a look at how deployments are going across all of your projects. Are things going smoothly? Are there... Um, hiccups that you're hitting all the time, that kind of thing, and just start to quantify that and see if you can reduce it over time. This is really like, the reason that we're here is to, to collect these sorts of metrics and to improve, to improve them. Yeah, so pick one thing, improve that, then pick another thing. Don't, yeah. don't try to improve everything all at once, it's, just, it's too daunting. Yeah, you can if you want. <laughs> right. So, and just to kind of loop back here, this is the model that we're working toward, and obviously these box, the, the choices of what's in the box is totally irrelevant. Um, the idea here is that as an organization, we really want to encourage you to be thinking about how you can move in that upward trajectory and build up that, that stack of things that you drop on the table when you walk into your next pitch meeting for another project. You have Circle CI. You have visual regression testing. You have whatever else. Uh, so, and then you can carry that forward to every single project that your your agency works on, or your company. That's it. Uh, I think we'll take some questions if anyone has has them. Thank you. Yeah, actually, if people could uh, step up to the mic as they have questions, I think the session is being recorded, so that would be great. Hi. I have hey. a question about uh, your local hosting. Uh, are those, are, do you guys both work in, uh, in uh, Pantheon-only environments? Because uh, no. uh, 
would or is it possible to switch land over so that it can it can uh, work on Acquia or Am uh, Amazon? Absolutely, it's it's hosting agnostic. It can, you can deploy anywhere you like. There are uh, integrations built in with Pantheon that you can leverage for uh, easy getting code from here to there. But you can also pull in platform tools and deploy to platform sh or anywhere really. Okay. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, regarding including everyone in DevOps, um, sort of as you, you know, move that out to all of your projects. Uh, do you have any strategies for dealing with uh, people on your team who are not like 100% developers? Maybe they work 10% of the time on Drupal, 90% of the time on content strategy, okay. and end up spending all 10% of their time yep. fixing their local development environment to deal with all these tools. Yeah, so I'll just ask the question um, again, make sure I get it. So it is how to include people that are non-developers in the DevOps process or very part-time developers, okay. Yeah, uh, I think that's a tough one. I think that your goal there should probably not be including them to, in the sense that like, they're not gonna be developing new solutions, uh, but their feedback is very valid, and it sounds like their feedback in this case was that they were having trouble with their local development environments frequently. So I think that that is valuable, and that is like the feedback that we wanna collect from them. Uh, so I wouldn't say that you have to put the DevOps hat on them, but I would say that they are contributing to it in the sense that they're giving you that feedback and that's something that you can assess and say, all right, is this causing a big enough problem to be worth fixing for us? So yeah, I mean, I, I think there are different levels of involvement here and not everyone is gonna be actually getting involved on the fixing things side. Some people are just gonna be identifying problems and that's totally fine. Uh, is this useful for setting up the uh, local dev environments for the developers as well as the uh, uh, continuous integration and uh, interaction with uh, the hosting services? Uh, are you asking about one of the tools specifically or? The Lando tools. Yeah, it certainly can package up all of your configurations. So once you configure the CircleCI integration and make that part of your Lando.yaml, then when the second developer pulls down the project, they do Lando start, it's gonna spin up all the same integrations that you had for the first developer. So they could do, uh, say, Drupal VM and uh, any of those and put in some configuration for that. Yeah, uh, Drupal, Drupal VM is an independent solution, but it's also configurable. So you, so you pick one of these tools to manage your configuration for the project. Similarly, Drupal Scaffold can manage the uh, housing of all of these configurations. Great, thank you. The uh, using Drupal project as the scaffold makes a lot of sense, especially for all the Drupal 8 projects you're doing. I imagine you still have Drupal 7 sites out there that you have to maintain that are probably way before Composer and all of that. Yeah. Do you have any experiences trying to share your, your DevOps infrastructure between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 sites? Yeah, it's definitely tough. Um, I think that you can still run Composer on Drupal 7 and it doesn't even necessarily have to be hooked in with the project to be able to pull in like shell scripts or whatever configurations you need uh, via like Composer. So yeah, I guess that's the way I would approach it. Probably like just set up a dummy Composer file in the root and pull that in, pull it in that way. Uh, of course, all of our all of our scaffold stuff doesn't work so well on Drupal 8 or Drupal 7, but we're able to share stuff like, you know, the PHP CS configurations and that kind of thing. We actually ended up implementing a slightly different solution for the scaffold uh, for sharing those like root files, like phpcs.xml, which just is capable of going and fetching them from GitHub based on Semver. So similar to Composer, but doesn't actually require like the registration of the package. Uh, so we can use that. Yeah, Lando has Drupal 7 and Drupal 6 recipes, so it's easy to switch between the different platforms. It has other recipes too. Yeah. Okay, well, so sure. the uh, two tools you mentioned seem to do a good job, making sure that developers are working in the same local environment. Mm -hmm. But how do you make sure that it mimics like what's running on production or test? Yeah. Right. 
In the case of Lando, we use the .lando.yaml configuration file to specify PHP versions and database backends uh, that are similar to the uh, hosting service. So if they're using Solar 4.6, we specify Solar 4.6 in that file. So we can granularly specify very close production parity that way. Yeah. And I think it's also worth pointing out that both of these tools are based on Docker, and Docker is able to match production very well. Uh, whether you take advantage of that by actually building your own Docker file is a whole other thing. Uh, just quick plug for Lando that they have very good production parity with you know Pantheon. I don't know. I don't know about Acquia, but uh, platform like you guys are pretty on it as far as keeping up with those recipes. So. Yeah, we have some <laughs> examples that are. Think can GitHub. Yeah. Good question. Like, um, so I've been using Homebrew for like, I don't know, for for forever, and I've got you know I've got it all set up, and like it's really fast, and I've got Solar, and I've got like Redis and Memcache and blah blah blah, and I switched to Lando, and it was like half again as fast, like it was just a lot slower, and then, you know, so I'm kind of like you know, and so how do you, I guess when you've got a developer that's like, you know, and like I version all of the, et, you know, the et, you know, like I do, I do a lot of stuff to kind of keep it like up, but mm -hmm. how do you deal with that kind of situation? Is like everyone should use Lando or is it kind of optional or, um, you know? Yeah, I think the value is, is if your team is, uh, you know, more than three, but you know, five or 10, then, then you have that shared configuration that can scale out across the team. But if you're a development team of one or two and you have the ideal stack, then, I think you should keep your ideal stack, you know, because you don't have to manage that complexity across developers. You're managing it for yourself, but once you have to pass it left or right to other developers, um, no, no way. Like there, th yeah, my setup is ridiculous, and like I have to um, like recompile PHP when I um, upgrade things. So it's wow. just you know, I mean, like you know, because it's there's. But I know it like really well, so I know like if I'm gonna have to upgrade things. So it's like you know because I'm yeah. yeah, it's just really fast. And just, yeah, I so like it. really hard to pass off to other developers. It's really great for you to do. Yeah, there's no, there. It's not something that I can. Pass right. Off to. Yeah. So and if that is a concern, that's probably, the, probably the jumping point yeah, is whether exactly. you have to pass that off or not. I would say that uh, yeah, Docker does have some specifically like file access slowness to it, um, which you know you have to weigh. Honestly, if you have multiple developers on a team, I think it's it's already, even if you have two, it's already easier to write it in Docker and then like deal with the slowness. But that's that balance is gonna be different for everyone. Yeah, you so. lose a couple seconds uh, on dev cycles, but you gain a lot by scaling out to a whole team. Ooh, I have the answer. Switch to Linux, woo! <laughs> oh, that's true, that's true. <laughs> I kid, I'm not on Linux. Any other questions? Cool. Well, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, feel free to contact us on Twitter if you're interested in chatting. And thanks for coming out.